And last week, how many are ready to get in the message this morning? Are you? How many, how many are ready to get in the message this morning? It's a little odd with the tables. If you're, if you're turned around, if your back is facing me, you can always turn your chair around. Uh, it'll, or you can turn, or you can keep it turned around. Maybe that's better for you. I don't know. Uh, last week we enjoyed the Christmas brunch together and I shared what could be considered a, a, basically a short devotional about Joseph. Of course, Joseph was the earthly father of Jesus. It was a bit chaotic. I know the tablecloths are like really, uh, loud. So. Caleb, don't even think about it. <laughs> but no, uh, just, yeah, move away from it if you need to. But last week we shared, just really, it was a bit chaotic. Uh, the main point of it was this. Joseph had the right to separate himself from Mary, but after hearing from the Lord, he obeyed. Amen? When we hear from the Lord, we want to obey. When we, when we hear the Lord's direction, we want to obey. It's an example that when the Lord gives clear direction, it's an example for us to follow that direction even when outwardly it doesn't make sense. A lot of times, outwardly, it doesn't make any sense at all. But the direction we have from the Lord is always the right direction to go. This morning, we are going to focus on Mary, the mother of Jesus. Now, I want to say it's not a very long message this morning. Uh, it's, it's really not. And next week, we're going to have service on Sunday morning, but it's also going to be a shortened service. So it's going to be uh, really, we're, my plan is to try to have you guys out of here by 1130. I understand people are going to have family obligations and things to do, but if you can join us for that Christmas service, it's going to be good. Amen. How many know the Christmas story? Raise your hand. Anybody not know the Christmas story? Most people know the Christmas story, either through Charlie Brown or through, you know, uh, reading the Bible, things like that. Of course, the danger of Christmas, at least when it comes to my perspective or the pastor's perspective, is that there are really only so many angles to come from. You have Joseph's view. You have Mary's view. You have the Magi. We're going to talk about the messengers of God, their view. A few years ago, how many remember a movie came out? It was like a kid's movie, an animated movie where it, they try to give it the perspective of the animals. Do you remember that? Is it, you didn't make a lot of money. I mean, I'm sure it was kind of a, a small thing. But uh, I guess that's a way to go. I don't know if, if they have an idea about what the donkey thought about Jesus being born. I'm sure it was probably something because he is creator, right? So I'm sure maybe, I don't know, maybe they hee-hawed or something. I don't, I don't know. But you can only come at the Christmas story from so many angles. And you don't want to like just come up with something brand new. So most of what is preached is classic. It's classic Christmas. It's not some new revelatory information. It's simply a reminder of God's goodness to us. It's a reminder of God's faithfulness to us. It's a reminder of His work in us. Don't let the message of Christmas just be familiar to you. Don't let the message of Christmas take, because we become callous to these things. We focus on the presents. We focus on Santa. We focus on all these different things. And those are fun things. And don't get me wrong. You can have fun with those things. But let's remember the reason for the season is Jesus Christ. Amen? Let me remind you of what God has done for you and me. Luke chapter 1, verse 26 says this. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. Verse 27 says, To a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. Verse 28 says, And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one. The Lord is with you. Let's pray together. Lord, I'm so thankful that we have today to come to celebrate before the day that we have the chance to come together as church family to come and celebrate your birth, to come and look at the angle of your mother, to come and look at the angle of what she went through. Lord, I pray that this week, as we get into Christmas and Christmas Eve and, and, and family and celebration and parties and presents and all the things that come along with it, Lord, I ask that our focus would be put on you, that we would be reminded of your goodness and your grace. In Jesus' name. Amen. When we talk about Mary, there's a few things that we can talk about. 
Mary, uh, scholars, most put her right around the age of 14 years old. 14 years old and going to have a baby. In Jewish culture, a woman, a girl became a woman at the age of 12. A boy became a man at the age of 13. So Caleb, how old are you? 12? You're almost there. You're almost a man. The, and then they weren't considered an old man until they were 40. So they were considered a young man. If they were 40 or below, they were considered a young man. Tim, how old are you? Yeah, you're right on the edge, man. I'm 41, so I'm, a, I'm an old man. Yeah, two weeks, don't brag. It's all right. No. Everybody say two weeks. Congratulations, Tim. Uh, two weeks, you're going to be 41. That's, that was the age. So they had kind of this system of young men, old men, young women, old women. At the age of 12 for women, they would be able to bear children. So we know, of course, that she was betrothed or engaged to Joseph. Now, there should be no doubt about the nature of Mary, of who she was, right? When the angel came to her, his greeting was followed by this, O oh, favored one, say favored, the Lord is with you. I mean, that's, that's a pretty positive thing for the angel to say. I would love it if an angel showed up one day and said, O oh, favored one, the Lord is with you. How many would like that? How many hope to hear someday my good and faithful servant? Amen? Mary hears, O oh, favored one, the Lord is with you. From all accounts, Mary is worthy of this honor. She sees the angel, and although she hears the greeting, she's scared. Why is she scared? Because you would be too. Why is she scared? Because she was human. Because Mary was not supernatural. Mary was human. Make no mistake, in no way do we want to take away from the goodness of Mary. In no way do we want to be disparaging to her name, right? But her goodness did not equate to sinlessness. We want to remember that Mary was not sinless. There are false teachings out there that she lived a sinless life that when they talk about the immaculate conception, they're not just talking about someone who is a virgin. They're talking about someone who had no sin. And that's a false teaching. That, uh, that she is to be prayed to, that she is to be worshipped. Listen, that is simply not the case. Mary is not worthy of my worship. Jesus Christ is. Amen? For sure she was a godly woman. She was obedient to God in raising the Christ child, right? But let's not fall into the trap of idolatry here. Some have taught that not only, I mean, she, she re, not only was she a virgin, you know, uh, up until Jesus' birth, but she remained one the rest of her life. That's taught that she remained one the rest of her life. There's simply no biblical way to back that up. None at all, because Jesus had brothers that we know of, and maybe had sisters, so she for sure had children after Jesus. I don't know about you guys, but Biology 101 tells us that she did not remain a virgin. Amen? Don't say amen too loud. This is a church after all. We don't, we don't, oh boy, I'm going to dig myself a hole here in a minute. It's interesting. She's said to have six more children after Jesus. There's no indication that they didn't have an earthly father, right? The only child that has been born of a virgin was Jesus the Christ, and anyone who teaches differently is simply lying to you. Another part of the false teaching is that Mary was without original sin. And again, no basis for this biblically. Mary was not sinless, but she was obedient. She was not perfect, but she was faithful. Amen? I want to be known as one who is not perfect. How many think your pastor is perfect this morning? Go ahead and raise your hand. Oh, Julie, thank you. A few people. How many? No? Okay. You think your pastor? No? Okay. Just, just checking. Uh, Eli, you think I'm perfect? Man, my own kid betrays me. Mary was not sinless, but she was obedient. I'm okay with, with not being perfect, but I want to be, be obedient, right? I think we have to be okay with not being perfect, but we want to be faithful. And so when we look, I'm not even asking my wife. I can tell you right now what she's going to say. 
he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at that saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Immediately, the angel calms her. The angel comforts her with his words. You have found favor with God. Someday, I I, I want to hear the words, my good and faithful servant. You have found favor with God. I believe that if you're a blood-bought believer this morning, you have favor with God in your life. I believe that we are, that we, that really that favor of God puts us above the world system. Amen? There's going to be things that will happen. God will bless you in your life in unexpected ways. And people will say, I don't understand it. How in the world do you do that? It's the favor of God. It has nothing to do with me. I was talking to my dad just uh, this last week, I think it was. And we were talking about not, not the brunch uh, a week ago, but the service two weeks ago where we had communion together, and it was jam-packed in here. I mean, we had, it was a little claustrophobic if you were here. It was, it was jammed. And, and I said to my dad, I haven't been doing anything different. It's just God just bringing people to the service. Amen? Because it doesn't have anything to do with me. It all has to do with him. Your pastor's not perfect this morning. I know I'm not perfect. There's lots of times where I know I'm not perfect. But God has favor upon those who are obedient to him. God has favor on those who are faithful to him. How good it must have been to hear the words that Mary heard. Oh, good and fa- that you are favored with God. And then came the reason for his visit. Verse 31 says this, and we, we know the story, but it says this. Behold, you shall conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. The angel comes and says, Mary, you're going to have a baby. You shall call his name Jesus. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary says, Mary's a little confused. She's a little perplexed. She says, how will this be since I'm a virgin? How will this be? I've never been with a man. The angel gives the news and Mary doesn't object, but she has this natural question. How could this be? And the angel answered her in verse 35. It says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. This woman who had no opportunity to have children who was barren in her womb has now been given a gift of a child. And now she's six months pregnant. And that child we know is John the Baptist, right? Verse 37 says it this way, for nothing will be impossible with God. How many know nothing is impossible with Him? How many know that when you have a lump that you go get checked and they say, oh, there's nothing there. Nothing is impossible with God. When there's sickness in your family and all of a sudden that sickness, there's healing that comes to there. Nothing is impossible with God. Amen. How many know that there are women who have been barren, but all of a sudden God opens up their womb to where they can have children because nothing is impossible with God. It's the hope that we have because nothing is impossible. The angel gives her both an explanation as well as a revelation. I love that. He gives her an explanation and says, hey, let me tell you a secret. You ever, I mean, this is one of those things about women. What? You don't know where I'm going, do you? Okay. Do you know where I'm going with <laughs> How many know a lot of women uh, don't like to tell that they're pregnant, right? Right, like right away, they, they, they don't want to tell everybody. They only want to tell a specific few people. Is that where you thought I was going? No, not at all. I'm going to have to ask you after the service where you thought I was going. I don't know what that noise was. <laughs> That's okay. Someone's messing with stuff. 
Oh, man, God is good this morning. Amen. It's an interesting thing that Mary didn't know that her, her cousin was pregnant. She didn't know what. No, I'm sorry. I'm saying this wrong. She didn't know that her relative Elizabeth was pregnant. Yeah, six months pregnant. She didn't know. So the angel says, hey, hold on a second. You should know she's pregnant. Six months pregnant. Nothing is impossible with God. Her relative Elizabeth is carrying the boy who becomes John the Baptist. We know this. And then we see Mary's character and strength in her response to the angel. And it's this. Mary said in verse 38, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. She was scared. Then she was calmed. She was scared. And then she heard the words of the angel. Behold, I am a servant of the Lord, she said. Let it be to me according to your word. Mary's response to the news the angel brings is, hey, you're going to be pregnant. I know you haven't been with a man. This is going to be the first time ever. Probably it's going to be the last time ever. And this is it. You're, you're the one picked. Mary's response is just simple obedience. I don't know if she worked through every scenario in her head. I really don't think she just kind of went, well, can you give me a minute? And went and thought about every scenario. Because when you think about the ramifications of her pregnancy, you could understand someone so young would be at least a little bit hesitant. Someone at 14 years old, my daughter's 15, not pregnant. <laughs> what? <laughs> Again, your pastor's not perfect, right? 15, not pregnant. We were talking the other day. She's, she's not getting married. Ever. <laughs> right? I'm sure that's what a lot of fathers say. But uh, it's one of those things where I, I, go, I, I think Mary was 14 years old. How in the world? At 14 years old, she was betrothed and engaged. She was ready to be married, sure. But now you think about the ramifications of her pregnancy and you could go, yeah, she'd be a little bit, I'm not sure I want to do this. One minister said that she could have lost Joseph, not only losing Joseph, she would have been ostracized from the community, and according to Old Testament law, she could have been stoned. She could have been killed. Mary, however, didn't raise any of these objections. She didn't raise any objections. She didn't ask for assurances that these things wouldn't happen. She didn't ask for to, to, to you know, uh, uh, what would have been a shameful thing. In fact, she was willing to obey even if those things did happen. This is the true mark of submission and sacrifice. The example we have in Mary is something to aspire to, right? To simply obey the Lord regardless of risk or potential embarrassment. There's another aspect of Mary. A few years ago, I shared uh, a song. I'm going to share it again on Friday. Uh, it's one of my favorite. It's called the. It's called the. Uh, it's called Mary's song. It's also called Magnifica. And if you haven't heard, it's a very powerful song. And we're not going to play it today. We're going to play it on Friday. It's worth noting what comes to us in verse 46, and then it goes through verse 55. And the Magnifica. It's it's in Latin, so but. It's Mary's song. It's taken from these verses in Luke. Let me share just a few of the verses with you this morning. My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for He has looked upon the humble estate of His servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things and great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear, who fear him from generation to generation. His mercy is for those who fear him, those who respect him, those who honor him, those who worship him, those who give him glory. This woman who is called blessed is so moved by this honor 
that God has given her is that she begins to sing a song of praise to him. Like I said, this Friday, our Christmas Eve service, we're going to take an even closer look at Mary's song and what it means for us. What follows in Scripture is, of course, the birth of John the Baptist and then the account of Jesus' birth that so many of us are familiar with is found in Luke chapter 2. If I could get um, Bobby, could you go get Jenny? Thank you. I told you I didn't have a very long message today, and I don't. I have a short one. It's, it's, it's one that I know that, you know, people have family and all sorts of stuff that they're even, even this week still doing things. So I don't have a long message this morning, but I believe it's an important one for us to be reminded of the simple obedience of Mary. The simple obedience of one who heard from the Lord and then did. Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 1. You're all familiar with it, but it's worth reading it because of Christmas. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went out to be registered, everyone to his own city. Verse 4 says, Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth to Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Verse 8 says, Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord, and this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, laying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And so it was when the angels had gone away from them and into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste, and they found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told to them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told to them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had seen and heard as it was told to them. The Christmas story. Don't let it become familiar to you. Many have heard it time and time and time and time again because it's such a special thing to go over. It's such a special thing to hear. Let there be a wonder and a marvel at God's goodness this morning. Let there be a marvel at the majesty of God who decides to come down and lay as a babe in a manger. It's an interesting thing. One of the things I love about the series that we're watching called Chosen is it shows the humanity of Christ. It shows the humanity of God. It shows the humanity that, that God stepped into our mess because He came as a baby. How many know sometimes babies make messes? Right? Think about Mary had to change Jesus' diaper. And you go, I've never thought about that before. Think about the humanity of Christ. There's a song, uh, oh little, uh, what is it? Uh, the cattle are lowing, uh, how does it go? Oh, in a manger, right? No crying he makes, 
right? That's the verse. So no crying. He doesn't. Uh, Jesus is just the perfect baby, just making no sound, no noise. Man, it's great. We can go out. We can go out to eat. We can go out to dinner. We can do whatever we want. Leave the baby alone. Oh, it's good. Jesus, right? That's not what happened. Mary took care of him as a mother to a child. Joseph was there as a father to a child. So we think about the humanity of Christ. We think about the humanity that He stepped into our mess to bring us righteousness. To bring us back into relationship with God. To bring us back into rightness with the Father. Here we see there is a plan in place. We see it unfold. And you are a part of that plan. How are you a part of that plan? The same way that I am a part of the plan. Because it was done for us. He is God with us this morning. Amen? Amen.